When we look at the past of computerdom, it's through a lens which is very peculiar because things have changed so much so fast. Now, to me, those the 50 years of since I've been in the computer field have uh, uh, gone so quickly that the past seems ever present. But that's that's of course true for anybody as you get older. That the the earlier days are more vivid, and the more recent ones seem. Uh, less important somehow or less, uh, less uh, detailed. In the 60s and 70s, a lot of young people started communes, and it was a combination of, of, of uh, free love, which is a term you don't hear anymore because it's taken for granted, and, 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 uh, and uh, pot, and uh, LSD, and idealism, and hopes for a new kind of economy. And, uh, and, and that spirit of that age leaked into the computer world, as I saw it, though I was not a communard and I didn't smoke pot and I didn't uh, and, and didn't uh, have opportunities for free love, but the uh, but there was lots of verve around that. There was a sense of possibility at the beginning that is different because we thought computing would be artisanal. We did not imagine great monopolies. We thought. The citizen programmer would be the leader. Uh, I'll never forget a fellow named Lyle Morrill who wore a helicopter beanie and he sold a, uh, a, a program called What's It? And the prompt was, What's It? question mark, and then you would ask something. And it, it, it was very cute and it was very clever. And that was to me the paradigm, the, the, the model of, of how it was going to be. But uh, on the other hand, I did have an ambition of creating a great software company, so, so uh, um, even in those days of artisanal and democratic visions, uh, the, the uh, entrepreneurial spirit, spirit and the notion of, of building up great enterprises was part of, part of the dream for everyone. We had vision. When I say we, I mean I, but of course, I sh had a sense I was sharing this with a lot of people, uh, had visions of democratization, of, uh, of citizen participation, of great vistas of possibility for, for artistic expression and uh, artistic expression in software. And software is an art form, although not generally recognized as such, because exactly how you position the, how you select the keys, exactly how you position the thing on the screen has an impact. So. In the old days, yes, there was a, a greater vision of, uh, and a shared citizen vision of, of possibility that, uh, that we of the, of the uh, personal computing movement had. I think my first computer conference had the biggest computer in the world, the CDC 6600. And it was, uh, oh, perhaps 40, 50 feet long uh, in, in separate bays. And I'm sure that uh, that the Apple Watch, not to not to simply laud one product, but but practically any anything you buy today has more power than the CDC 6600 because everything has gotten smaller and faster at a rate predicted by Moore, but in Moore's law, but uh, Moore said he got that from Douglas Engelbart, that the the notion that everything was going to get smaller and faster. Now Doug Engelbart. Douglas Engelbart was a great friend of mine, but he was a great man. I met him in 1966, but it was his vision was, I think, in 1951, when he said, when he said to himself, the problems of the world are escalating, and they're more and more complicated, and what can we do? We need new tools and new ways to support teams of people doing hard work. One of his models, the models in his mind, was de designing an airplane which had many parts and lot, took a lot of people. And so he invented word processing, outline processing, uh, computer graphics, <laughs> uh, hypertext, uh, uh, the mouse. And all of this was not, all of this was part of his singular dream how do we make people more powerful? And so all the tools that you could use are relevant. So what tools do we build? What 
hopes do we have? What dreams may come? I don't know. I thought of myself when I got out of college as a philosopher and a filmmaker. I had majored in philosophy and still thought a lot about it. And, uh, and I'd made my first film, which is on YouTube, and I'm very proud of it. And so I'm sure that, uh, that uh, I was sure when I saw that you could put a screen on computers, an interactive screen, my God, that changed the world. Interactive screens could do anything. I'm a filmmaker. Screens, I can do that. And the people who were working with them didn't get it. They were engineers. They were thinking about specific engineers. People at NORAD and, and, uh, and air traffic control were specific, thinking about specific engineering problems, albeit on a vast scale, whereas the people at MIT and Stanford were thinking more about artificial intelligence and robots that would control our lives. I was thinking about media for the public. And because of Moore's Law, which had been stated to me not as Moore's Law, but just as a general principle, things are going to get faster and cheaper. We will be able to afford it. Right now, a computer with a screen is $35,000. Tomorrow, who knows, it'll be $100 someday. <laughs> so that uh, now is the time to start thinking about what would be the documents of the future. So I said, how, what can you do in, on the screen that you can't do on paper? And I was a writer. I'd done a great deal of writing. And I believe some rather original magazine layout and stuff. And so I was very open to new ways of doing this. I didn't like the restrictions of paper. As I would abstract it now, the two concepts were we can have parallel connections between visible documents. So you can have, you can have two pages with a connection saying this sentence is connected to that paragraph and see it as a visible strap or bridge. And... and uh, and uh, you can't do that yet. So that was one of my hypertext concepts. And the other hypertext concept was, was being able to click on something and jump to it. So uh, as the hypertext concept developed and deteriorated over the years, the, uh, only the jump link became popular in the hypertext systems of the 60s and 70s. And then Tim Berners-Lee uh, uh, created the World Wide Web, which was the sixth or seventh hypertext system on the internet. <laughs> People think it sprang from the brow of Zeus, and in fact, it was just a clean, a clean job that had the clout of CERN behind it. And so uh, it, it, it wasn't that magical or magnificent. It's just the one that caught on. And if my team had delivered a year before when they were supposed to, uh, I was not in charge at the time, uh, uh, it might have been Xanadu instead of the World Wide Web. I consider myself an artist. And it's very hard to delegate if Rembrandt said, now put, put another touch up there, now, now go over there with the pink, it would have slowed down and considerably lessened the impact of his work. I don't program. I am a producer director of software, and so I have to work through others. And this is very difficult. And bringing new people on board is extremely difficult. My special ability is that I can visualize things other people can't. And, uh, and trying to get that vision out to where you can see it and use it. This is the hardest thing I face. So just trying to get on to the next step of uh, getting something out that people can see, understand, and begin to work with. This is my prayer, and it has been for a long time. So knowing what, direction, knowing what directions are viable, it's like striking out across country in a land you don't know. One of the pages I came upon recently was a listing of dead computer languages. I think the, the number was over 10,000. And there's something like 50,000 computer languages now that are, that are in use. And they're all, they all have their champions and, and, uh, and uh, mostly maintained by volunteers who eventually will grow old or find something else to do. And uh, trying to decide what direction to go, my God, who knows? Because... There are so many possibilities. Will so-called virtual reality and augmented reality with goggles be, be, be the great big thing, or will it be like 3D movies, a, uh, a, an enjoyable but niche market? The enthusiasms of the present and the future have to be tempered by an understanding of the enthusiasm of the past and where they led and didn't lead. We want a future in which the dreams and ideals of the past can go on to the future in the best possible way with the best outcome and not be hijacked by local considerations and, and scaremongering and, 
and narrow-minded thinking. How to see the possibilities when there are so many things around you that are a certain way? I can't, I don't know. My first software designs were largely done with my eyes closed, thinking, now, if I hit that key, what should happen? If I hit this key, what should happen? I was able to imagine, they, they say this can't be done, but I, when my interfaces were built, they always felt the way I knew they would. And, I, and the people at Xerox Park said, that's never possible. You never know how it's going to feel. But I did. All I can say to the young is, close your eyes. <laughs> Movie editing is the most painful job in the world. I, uh, when I made my first film, and <clears throat> I, I was so ashamed of this, I, th I, thought I, could, I thought I could edit it in one weekend, and it took a whole summer, Saturdays, full day Saturday and Sunday for a whole summer, to edit my 100 minutes down to a 30-minute comedy. But then I found out Orson Welles had the same problem when he, <laughs> when he started. 